y'all doing i'm the watchman and this is part six part six of satan's lie that shook up christianity satan's lie that shook up christianity now it started off with showing how we've been taught that 99 percent of christianity has been taught that the word belief like in john 3 16 when it says for whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That that word belief, we've been taught that it's a thought belief. A thought belief when really it means to be persuaded unto or to trust fully to commitment. To be persuaded unto action or to trust fully or to be committed unto or to make a commitment to make a commitment so then when you say it different for whosoever is committed to Christ shall not perish but have everlasting life but it went from there and we went through and justification sanctification glorification to the sanctuary and showing you know then we went to the sanctuary and how the sanctuary is the key to salvation and now we're going to show in this one how justification sanctification and glorification and the sanctuary are one how they're all one and in the same place and in the same thing and i'm not too sure if uh i mentioned this in the last in part five about how the, the sanctuary was from the very beginning, from the very beginning of the universe. Go with me to Jeremiah, but I'm going to do it right quick. We're going to do this in a couple minutes because there's a lot of stuff I want to show in this one. Uh, Jeremiah, and the more I learn about the sanctuary, the more everything opens up. So if you have pen pen and paper, trust me, get get your pen and paper, take your notes. Like I, like I stress, the truth loves investigation and also never leave your salvation in a man's hands 
Know what you believe. Know what thus saith the Lord says for yourself. Go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17 and we're going to read verse 12. Jeremiah 17 and I'm going to read verse 12. It says, A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Of course, God's throne. God's throne was the first thing established in the whole universe. And it says, A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. So we know that before there was a galaxy, before there were other planets, there was the heavenly sanctuary. You know what this means? I'm going to run through it real fast. We know that the heavenly, sanct the, the heavenly sanctuary, you know, the earthly is just a pattern of the heavenly. So the, the, the heavenly sanctuary is all about the plan of redemption. The heavenly sanctuary is all about Christ. So that means from the very beginning of time, God has wanted to exalt his son. From the very beginning, and that's and it made perfect sense to me why God said that the plan of salvation was laid before the foundation of the world. Paraphrase, but I'm sure most of you might be familiar with that verse. That the plan of salvation was laid before the foundation of the world. Usually we tend to think that that word world just stands for earth. That word, that word world could stand for earth but also could stand for the whole known universe the world the world and it says so knowing that the south the sanctuary was laid the sanctuary was from the very beginning of all things the first place ever established was the sanctuary and the sanctuary points to christ that means that the plan of salvation was established before anything else was established. Wow, doesn't that show how loving God is? That before God made a planet, before he made water, before he made anything, any living being, anything, before he made an angel, he made, and him in Christ, laid the plan of salvation. And this thought just hit me. It's like they were sitting there saying, how can we know? Because you know, God says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. They know the beginning from the end. It's like they were standing there and they were like, how can we make other beings? How can we make other galaxies? Knowing that sin is going to sprout its head and not have a plan of salvation. How about let's make the plan of salvation. Then we can be at ease and have fun making everything else that we're going to make in the universe. Let's get our plan of salvation out of the way first. That way we can just have fun and at ease in creating the other beings and other worlds. But this also shows that since the sanctuary points to nothing, no one but Christ, this shows that Christ is the center of the universe. Christ is the center of the universe <clears throat> as he should be the center of our lives as he should be so it's deep knowing that the sanctuary was the first place ever established before there was a world before there was anything there was the sanctuary and of course because God's throne is located in the sanctuary and we know his throne was before all things but anyway Okay, that's that's a point. And another point I want to make before I get into justification is the beauty of the sanctuary is you can look at the sanctuary. Now, we went over the pattern in five, and I'm not going to go over the pattern again because there's a lot that I want to get into in, in this vid. But you can look at the sanctuary and see where you're lacking in your Christian walk. You can ask yourself like this. Here I go with my, my artful drawing. You can look at each piece and say, you know, have I, have I made a, a separation from the world? You know, am I really separate from the world in the way I dress, talk, in the way I think? You know, am I being, do I have my gate up? Or you could say, do, am I focusing on the blood like I should? Cross and Calvary. Is my mind on Jesus like it should be? You know, 
And and I mean, this is a serious thing to ask yourself, beloved. We can get caught up in in so much of the doing for the church and the the making sure we go by the commandments and things of this nature that we can't forget about Christ. And then we can also what I call underestimate or no underrate. We can underrate the blood of the Lamb, beloved. We've heard about the blood so much as children growing up that sometimes I believe like Brother Roger Morneau said, he said a lot of Christians don't really know the full power of the blood of the Lamb. And I was like, wow, you're, you're right. Because I, I had to look at myself. I'm like, because I heard about it my whole life growing up, you know, the blood, power in the blood. It, 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 in my mind, it had become minuscule like and because Roger Morneau was coming from uh satanic worship where they used to use blood for their rituals he was like Jesus's blood is the most potent and most precious substance on earth and, and he said a lot of Christians don't see it as such mm. So, like I said, you can use the sanctuary to see where you might be lacking in your Christian walk. Like I said, uh, with the with the labor, am I holding on to old memories? Am I really letting the devil beat me up? This is why I used to I used to fall to all of these y'all. But you know, am I holding on to old memories? It, it, do am I really realizing that Jesus' blood has changed me and I'm a new creature? Am I the one keeping that old man inside of me or that old man? Am I allowing the devil to have me thinking that I'm that old man? Am I utilizing being made new, being made new? And then we have, then ask yourself, are you reading the word like you should be? Are you reading the word like you should be? Are you praying and listening to God? Because communication Prayer is a two-way street. It's not just us asking, but it's also us listening. Or am I witnessing to others? Is is God showing in my character? Is he showing? Am I keeping his law like I should? Am I showing reverence? People say, oh, you're a legalist. Keep the law. No, that's showing reverence to the lawgiver. <laughs> You know, the only theme stressed throughout the whole Bible, the only theme from Genesis to the last chapter of Revelation, Revelation 22. And I want to say 14, but let me look it up real quick. So I don't. So I'm just not guessing. Revelation 22 from from the book of Genesis to the very last chapter. Revelation 22 verse 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life. So when somebody says, oh, you're a legalist, you want to keep the God, that's the only thing that's stressed in every single book of the Bible is fear God and keep his commandments. Beloved, like I say, the truth loves investigation. Try to prove me wrong on that. That is the only, like when I say theme, literally, that is said in every single book of the Bible from the beginning to the end, like we just read, is it, he ends the Bible. In the last chapter, he ends it by saying, blessed are they that keep the commandments. But anyway, let's keep going. So that's one thing I wanted to, to throw in and remind. But we have some, a blessing today on how is justification, sanctification, and glorification in the sanctuary one? How are they one? And, and why is that important? Like I brought up in the earlier, earlier vids, when dealing with, you know, man was right here. Man and God used to be like this. Sin came and put a river in between man. Jesus died on the cross and Jesus became, you know, because of his grace, because of his grace, he became a paddle boat for us. You know, he because only because of grace, Jesus became a paddle boat for us. Now, some people believe that Jesus will make people get in the boat when they say you don't have to do nothing to be saved. You know, if if that's true, then everybody should be saved. You know, the, nobody should ever lose their soul because Jesus died for all. 
didn't he? Didn't he die for all? Then why aren't all saved? So there's obviously some things that you have to do. If every single person is not going to be saved in the end, that means some people are doing what's right, some people are doing what's wrong. But anyway, Jesus became the paddle boat. You have to make the, the gate, you have to make a commitment to get your butt in the boat. You have to get inside the boat. One or is justification. The other or is sanctification. When used together, when used together, you get to the other side. And that's where God and his glory, you know, and you will glorify God. When you use them together and you're rowing in motion, while you're going to the other side, you will glorify God in your character and in yourself, in your being. But, beloved, we need to see why justification, sanctification, and glorification are with the sanctuary. And trust me, this, when I say the sanctuary is the key to salvation, it is the key to salvation. It is the key to salvation. All right, real quick. Now, we know justification. Now, justification, sanctification, glorification. We got three. Three. We got three compartments in the sanctuary. How many are in the Trinity? Got the Father, got the Son, got the Holy Spirit. We got three. Is that a coincidence or is it divine design? I say divine design. Now, who out of the Trinity, out of the Trinity, who you think justifies? Of course, it's Christ. Because we're justified. We are made clean through his blood. So it's Christ that justifies. It is Christ that justifies. So right here, I'm going to take my marker. Where is Christ represented in the sanctuary? Of course, the whole sanctuary is about Jesus. Did you even see? I'm going to do this. I got this from Ivor Myers. Pastor Ivor Myers. Watch this. This is how deep it is. The sanctuary, when made look from the air, it even makes a cross. When you look at it, the sanctuary, the Old Testament tabernacle from the air, it even makes a cross. Divine design. But anyway. Anyway. All right. The blood of the Lamb, of course, is Christ. You know, the Lamb represents Christ. So we're going to say, and who, who justifies? Christ. So we're going to say up here, justification. In the courtyard. But is that all to show? No. Because here you are made clean. You are justified in the courtyard. You, you, you made a commitment to, to separate from the world. You accept the blood of the lamb. Hence, you are made clean into a new creature. You are justified. So the courtyard is justification. And even more on top of that, what gives light to the courtyard? During the day, the sun gave light to the courtyard during the day. And a pillar of fire by night. And a, a, you know, a pillar of a cloud of smoke hung over the whole sanctuary during the day. But during the day, what gave light to the courtyard? The sun. Do you see a coincidence with that? Out of the Trinity, who is the sun? Okay. I answered that pretty much myself. Of course, that's Christ. So the sanctuary was lighted by the sun. Do you think that's a coincidence? Hmm. Let's see. If each, now remember, divine design with the threes. Each of the Trinity is represents each piece of the sanctuary. So you have, you're justified in the courtyard. You made a commitment to separate from the world. You accepted the blood. Hence, you are made into a new creature. You are justified. You are justified, and you're only justified through Jesus. And it's the sun that gives light to the courtyard. So, Jesus, justification, the courtyard, the Trinity three. So, sanctification, the meaning of sanctification means to be made holy. To be made holy. So, do we think it's a coincidence 
that the place that you were made holy would be the holy place. <laughs> this is the courtyard, literally. It's crazy. God works divine design, literally. And God is so simple. God is so simple. We have the courtyard, but the next compartment is literally called the holy place. The holy place. Sanctification, the meaning of sanctification is to be made holy. Where else would you be made holy but the holy place? Let's write it right there. Sanctification. And trust me, right after I show this, I got some wonderful things to show, some new stuff to show about Jesus in the sanctuary. Sanctification. Who gives light to the holy place? Jesus, the Son gives light, the S-U-N gives light to the courtyard. And we know that the Son is a representation of Jesus because it gives light to the whole world. Who gives light to the, the holy place? You say the, the candlestick, right? Well, what, what causes the candles to burn? The Holy Spirit oil. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Oil is what causes the candles to burn inside of the candlesticks. And what is represented by oil in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. So it is the Holy Spirit who actually gives light to the holy place and deal with sanctification sanctification to be made holy cuz and this is so important this is this is probably the most important fact of whatever I'm going to show you today cuz I got a whole bunch of stuff I'm going to show you today and that is kind of why I'm rushing if the bible says we are saved through sanctification. Why aren't we just saved through justification? If remember the story of Leah and little Israel. Leah's the mom. Here, little Israel, she she puts him on clean clothes. You know, she lets him go outside and play. He goes outside, runs, get in the mud, comes back in. She washes him up, put the clothes in the dirty clothes hamper, puts him on clean clothes again, lets him go back outside. He runs straight to the mud, play dirt, comes running back in the house. She cleans him up again, and then she finally says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to tell him he can't go outside, but I'm going to also... Give him some better stuff to play with in the house. That way he'll forget about not being able to go outside. And then he, he'll be able, he'll stay clean. <laughs> then he'll stay clean and I won't have to keep washing him up and taking off his dirty clothes. Beloved, every time she changed his clothes, she was that's justification. She made him clean. He was, he was made clean. He was justified. But when she gave him a rule, when she said you cannot go outside and she gave him other stuff to occupy his time and she when she gave him other stuff to occupy his time and he remained clean and he remained clean, that was sanctification. He remained clean. And remember, the meaning of sanctification is to be made holy. And that's why the word says through sanctification comes salvation. Because if you just stay right here, if you just stay in the, the courtyard and, and think about it, 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 divine design. And my the study group that we have, uh, that we do on the sanctuary on uh, Sabbath nights, Friday nights, uh, we 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 went through this last Friday night, and it was just it was just wonderful. We had a great time, but here, if you stay out here in the courtyard with justification, which a lot of a lot of Christians do, what can you see? Remember, the little boy kept running back outside. Well, if you just stand right here, you're gonna keep running outside that gate because you can see the world out here. You can see what everybody's doing. You know, you can see the world. And if you just stand out here, you can just keep, you know, you're going to eventually, you're going to go right back outside. And you have to come back in here. Go right back outside. 
you know, and that is why. So why with sanctification? So one of the reasons when you are, when you come in here, your mind is no longer on the world. That's just one of the reasons. That's just one of the reasons. But you have to maintain your cleanliness, even though it's the blood that justifies. The reason why sanctification is sal salvation is through sanctification is because you can keep getting dirty, but soon, if this door closes and you're dirty, you know, you're dirty, you, 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 you're not acceptable. You can't go in front of the Father. Sanctification is what keeps you clean to make you worthy to stand in front of the Father. It makes you worthy to stand in front of the Father. Y'all might say, well, Josh, where are you getting this verse from about salvation being the key to uh, sanctification? Well, let's see. Let's see here. I didn't plan on showing this, but this is how our Father works. Go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Okay, if I can find it first. Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Beloved, I'm telling you, once you learn the sanctuary in this, verses like this start to make sense. It says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. What is belief of the truth? Belief of the truth is justified. But it says, verse 13, towards the end, it says, But God has chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit through sanctification of the spirit which entity which entity represents the holy place which entity gives light to the holy place is the spirit the holy the holy spirit okay i don't even know why i showed y'all that word you can't tell from this angle but the holy spirit so I, I, I used to read that verse or read verses like that where they say you need to be sanctified. I know we've all heard it. You need to be sanctified and sanctification. And you're like, you know, I, what is sanctification? You know, they say, well, that's how you're made holy. Well, where do I start? Beloved, when you look at the sanctuary, when you look at the sanctuary, it's easy. God is so simple. What's the first thing? In the holy place is the word of God. The first, your first step in sanctification is what then? What should you be doing? Reading and meditating on the word of God daily. And, and beloved, when I just say, I'm not just talking about a little bit here, a little bit. Make it the focal point of your life. You know, make it the focal point of your life i mean i'm not just saying the only thing you know of course have other things and enjoy other stuff feel what i'm saying but make it if anything gets the majority of your time of your energy of your attention make it the word of god you know make time for other things i do too make time for other things but make the word of god make it the the most that you uh if the it, it receives make it it receives the majority of the time your time and energy is the word of God. So concerning your sanctification, and we see like we said in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse thirteen, where God clearly says word for word that salvation comes through sanctification, and it also says it again in First Peter one two, First Peter chapter one verse two, but. Since we see that salvation comes through being made holy, the first our first step in being made holy is reading and dwelling on the word. Our second step is focusing on our communication with God, our prayer life, listening to the Lord and talking to him. 
Not just asking for stuff all the time, but just talk to him. Talk to him. That'll make me mad too. If if what if that make you know if my kids the only time they say something to me is they ask for something. <laughs> I had to start laughing because a lot of times my youngsters are six and seven years old. And a lot of times that is <laughs> Is they asking for stuff all the time, but now, but we talk, talk, you know, I mean, our communication is open, open. And so God just don't want us to just be asking for stuff all the time. I mean, honestly, look at yourself. If, if you just, the only time you praying is you asking God for something. Ask yourself, is that, do you want a friend like that? The only time they talking to you is they always asking for something. What do you usually do to people like that? You cut them off. I mean, you, you don't exactly cut them off, but you kind of wean away from them. Like honestly, if that's all they ever is, they always ask for something. You 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 naturally like wean away from them. Well, beloved, treat God with that same respect, you know. But this is your walk in your safe face, and then share God with others. Share, beloved. This is probably the most forgotten about piece of the share. It does something for your soul. I don't know God like David said in Psalm 77 14 God is a God of wonders I don't know what sharing God does magic maybe not the best word to use it does wonders for your soul it does wonders for your soul and for your own walk for your own walk so beloved when G when God says that our salvation is through sanctification I see why. And because of the sanctuary, we know how to live a sanctified life. How to live a sanctified life. And what's the last one when we say? Justification, sanctification, glorification. We ain't even got to guess which, which one represents glorification. Glorification. Do we, you know... We said Jesus represents justification because we're ju you're only justified by the blood of the Lamb. The Holy Spirit, even Second Thessalonians chapter two says, it's the Spirit who sanctifies. So of course, who glorifies? You know, God, God, who gives light to the most holy place. <laughs> God, God Himself gives light to the most holy place. In the form of the Shekinah glory. The Shekinah glory. When God comes down and sits on his throne, which is the mercy seat, on the day of atonement. On the day of atonement, when God would come down and sit on his throne, he would light up the most holy place. So, you know, God gives light to the most holy place. God is represented in the most holy place is in the most holy places glorification glorification so beloved you have justification in the courtyard sanctification in the mo in the holy place and glorification in the most holy place and why don't you just when beloved think about it when when people say this is some of the false doctrines that the sanctuary naturally breaks down when people say you're no longer under the law you're under grace I don't want to get into a big dispute about this to people, you know, but, but when I look at the sanctuary, though, when I look at the setup, I'm no longer under the law. Where is the law? What is the devil really saying? That's why every I, I, everybody who's ever said that to me, who comes and leave me messages, I always ask them, have you studied the old the sanctuary? They have not studied because when you study the sanctuary, if you say the law is no longer binding, what sits on top of the law? You have the law right here. Then you have God's throne. Let me say it again. You have the law and God's throne is attached, attached to the law. They are one piece of furniture. Let's not get let's not get it twisted. The God's throne is sits on top of his law. Like he says, to change my law, you gotta move me off of my throne. And we know that ain't happening. I don't even like saying it. I wanna say, forgive me for even just saying that, even though he know I was doing a <laughs> description. I don't even like saying that. But for when people say we're not un no longer under the law, we're under grace. 
basically saying we don't need the most holy place. X out, X out. We don't need the most holy place. We don't believe in the most holy place. I'm showing you how the sanctuary can break down false doctrines. We don't need the most holy place. That is literally what they, and a lot, most don't even realize it. But isn't that how the devil works? Isn't that how he works? He'll have you, he'll have you disrespecting God's throne. He'll have you not being able to walk through this blessed assembly line to be made new and you not even realize it. And then you're just staying right here or you're just staying right here. You know, because you feel you don't even need the law. So you're not even going to go into the most holy place. Your thoughts ain't even on the most holy place. And what's in the most holy place? It's God's throne. It's God himself. But anyway, you ever heard that? I've heard churches say, "You, we don't need the Old Testament. You don't need the Old Testament. You know, uh, that's the Old Covenant. So don't read the Old Testament. Now, first off, before I even show how the sanctuary breaks that down, I just tell people like this sometimes. I like saying, so... That's like me handing you a book and say, don't, don't start at the beginning. <laughs> start halfway through. Man, it's a great book. You know, think about it. These are Christians. I ain't going to say the denomination. But I've had Christian denominations, you know, I, I want to stay. But, you know, they'll, come and they'll, they'll tell me, they'll say, man, you know, Jay, we don't believe in the Old Testament. We just believe in the New Testament. I say, for real? So you don't read or study the old? They say, nah, we don't read or study the old. So that's basically like them coming to you say, man, this is a great book. You know, God's word. This is God's word. It's a great book. But uh, start halfway through it. Don't, don't start at the beginning. Start, start halfway. And it ain't even halfway because the Old Testament make up the majority of the Bible. So they're like, here, uh, I'm going to give you this. But don't start up here. You read, you start about right here. <laughs> you know, stuff. I, it's, that is literally what they're saying. Now, what piece of furniture are they skipping over when you look at it in the sanctuary? Yeah, they just Xing out the table of showbread. So, and, and, and I'm going to show you the dangers of this. I'm going to show you the dangers of this. So, they just Xing out the table of showbread. We have to remember the devil knows his Bible. And he knows God's dwelling place. He was a part of it, beloved. Ezekiel chapter 28. I want to say verse 16 or it starts at verse 14. Verse 18. Now see, because I didn't get right. Well, let's look real fast. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. He was one of the cherubs that sat. There are two cherubs that sit on the Ark of the Covenant. He was one of these cherubs. He knows the sanctuary better than 90% of all Christians. 90, let me, that's, that's exaggerating a little. Better than 98% or 99% of all Christians. Satan knows the sanctuary its patterns and its power and its glory. Let's not get it twisted. This is a wildly foe that we're dealing with. You know? And he has people saying you don't need to read the whole Bible. You're Xing out the table of showbread. Why is that important? Of not to do? Beloved, each piece is even in order important. I didn't even get into this shit, but I'll just go on and spit a little bit. I'll, I'll say a little bit on it. But... There's a there's a reason for every order. The reason why you have to make a commitment before you can accept the blood is because then you'll misuse the blood. You'll abuse the blood. You know, you'll abuse the blood. You'll you'll you use it all up. If if you don't make a commitment to separate from the world, then you're gonna have to keep a a, a how is it like an IV of Jesus blood just constantly flowing because every second you know you're not trying to change so you're constantly sinning you don't see nothing wrong with sin so why should the blood cleanse you if you know it's like the little boy if you're just gonna sit down in the mud puddle why should mom keep putting clean clothes on you you have to make a commitment to be separate from the world even though we will fall you are gonna fall you are gonna sin every day but if God sees you earnestly striving earnestly striving then it's okay. But that's the thing. You have to earnestly be striving. But anyway, that's the, that's the reason why the gate is before the before uh, the blood. There's a reason why the blood is before being made cleansed. Why? Because only the blood can make you new. 
Only the blood can make you into a new creature. Only the blood. That's why the blood comes before being made new. Why is being made into a new creature before the table of showbread? Because your old man that was right here isn't going to eat this holy bread. He ain't going to like the holy bread. Not when he's used to what God called the flesh pots of Egypt out here. He isn't going to like that bread. That's why God has to make you to a new creature to wipe away your taste buds. He has to give you brand new taste buds. He has to give you a brand new mind that won't say if, if the old man tasted that. First thing in your mind is this nasty. What don't this is what? But when when you're made new, then you can you can enjoy that fresh new. Mm, is that the book of John? Give me some hot sauce. You know, you can enjoy the word. Like, you know, I'm eating John. Tomorrow, go to Malachi. I'm going to read Malachi tomorrow. You know, and that's when you start to really enjoy. When you're made new, you you become a child of God now. You're, you're, you're a child of God now. You're, you're born into the spiritual world. Your carnal is now old. Your carnal was done away with. But that's the reason why being made new. And now you're born into the spirit the spiritual house of God so now you can eat spiritual food that is why it's right and why is the table of showbread before prayer this is why the devil has a lot of Christians saying we don't need to read the Old Testament you gotta know because this is the Word of God this is how you get to know God by reading his word right tell me beloved if you don't read the Bible how are you gonna know who you communicate with can you communicate with somebody you don't know? Honestly. Can you talk? Can you have a great prayer life? Or can you have a great, let's not even use God as the example. Let's use people you work with in your home, school, wherever you are. Can you have a great communication? Great communication with people you don't know? What are you going to talk about? You can, you can say, hey, you can you know speak a little bit but do you, can you can your communication be great can it can it be strong no why cuz you don't know them so that is why the word is before communication you have to get to know who you you have to know who you're talking to and then reason why the communication is for being a light how you going to tell people how you going to tell people about god and about the kingdom of God, if you you don't even, like I said, and it goes to the holy place. If you don't know them, you can't tell people about them. But then again, you can't communicate them to others if you ain't communicating them with yourself. If you don't know how to talk to somebody, if you don't know, let's just say like this. If you don't know the best way to talk to God, or if you don't know the ways to talk to God and come at God or communicate with God, how are you going to tell somebody else to communicate with you can't tell other people to communicate with God if you don't know how to communicate with God. If you ain't doing it, you know, how you going to tell others how to do it? You know, it makes no sense at all. You know, and if you're not, and the reason why this is before the throne, because if you're not reflecting God in your character, he's not going to recognize you when you come in here. God is pure holiness. He's pure. No sin, no defilement. He only sees reflections of himself. That's deep. But it's the truth. God only sees reflections of himself. So if you're not reflecting him right here, if you don't start reflecting God in your character, he's not going to recognize you. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7? I believe starts at verse 21 when he, at the end when he says, when they, people say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these? And they say wonderful works. So they were doing all this stuff in Jesus' name. We all this time and energy. And Jesus says, I never knew you. Why? Because come judgment, come the second coming, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit are only going to recognize themselves. They're only going to recognize reflections of themselves. That's it. That's it. So, beloved, that is one way the sanctuary is the key on so many levels. So many levels. I didn't think this would take this long, but I'm going to keep going real quick because there's some important stuff I definitely wanted to share. In part five, at the end of part five, uh, uh, a friend of mine who's now become, you know, a friend, uh, I'm not even sure he uh, he had been watching the videos and he left a comment 
the first comment that he left. And that's why I tell y'all, leave some comments when, especially, I don't know everything by far. There is millions of stuff in this world that I don't know. And one of the ways I like learning is through others, through my my brothers and sisters. I'll never be that type of way I feel like I can't learn something from you. You know, that's that's by far. But this is his name, like uh, on his YouTube name. Uh, I'll let him, if you want to, uh, you can see his comment on part five when he talks about how he said you know jesus lived the sanctuary pattern in reverse and this is his youtube name this is his youtube name and uh i know his real name but i'll let him tell it to you if he if he like you know he might not want it out there but he said how jesus lived the sanctuary pattern in reverse and i'll just going to share it with you if you didn't see the comment on the last one you know when you look at the ark of the covenant Maybe let me get a, a fresh copy. Let me get a fresh copy of the, the sanctuary. All right. When you, he said, he said, Jesus left the most holy place to come down to us. So that's like him leaving here. And I want to expound, you know, he was the Shekinah, you know, because that is God would come down once a year. And this is me expounding a little extra on it. And, and I appreciate you for sharing this, brother. But he was the Shekinah that came down from heaven as God in the Shekinah came down to the earthly tabernacle once a year on the Day of Atonement. Didn't Jesus come to make atonement for our sins? It blew me away when he shared this. But Jesus came down as the Shekinah to make atonement. Even the cherubims. Now, this is me picking apart what he said. Even the cherubs whose job was to protect God's throne and protect his law. Jesus came to vindicate God. He also came to show us what God's law, how to live his law in our hearts. Jesus came to show us how to live, to be living examples of his law. This way, I'm going the wrong way. Jesus was also showed us how to be a light to the world. He was a light to the world. He showed, he showed us how to be a light to the world. He showed us how to communicate with the Father. He showed us how to have a prayer life. He showed us how to pray. He gave us the step, the pattern of prayer, you know, with the Lord's Prayer. He doesn't say do that prayer word for it every time, but it's actually a pattern. You know, when he says, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He praises God first. So he's saying we, in your prayer life, before you just get to asking and talking, praise God first. Give him the respect and honor that's due. That prayer is actually a pattern. Y'all should look into that. But anyway, Jesus showed us how to communicate with God. He got up early in the morning, late at night. He's talking, stayed in communication with God. So he was a light to the world. He showed us how to communicate with God. He was the word made flesh and dwelt among us, as John says. He was baptized. But when he was baptized, what did God, a voice from heaven came and said, God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus was baptized so that we all, through his baptism, might be that when we're baptized now because of Jesus's one time baptism when we partake in baptism we're grabbing a hold of that the same way that we grab a hold of his blood when he died on the cross is the same way that we grab a hold of his one time baptism beloved I, I I'm going to stress on that I'm going to talk about that more but anyway when God said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased through Jesus we're showed and through Jesus because of Jesus's one time baptism we now that when we're baptized and made new, God above, beloved, believe it or not, says, this is my beloved, add your name in. He says, this is my beloved Joshua, in whom I am well pleased. And then he became the lamb that was slain. He became the lamb that was slain so he could stand at the door of the gate, meet us here. And walk us back through the path. I told my brother, I said, wow, you truly bless, you truly bless me with that knowledge. And if you want to see, he wrote it out at the uh on part five 
it's in the comment part it's in the comment part it's in the comment part and again this is his name is this is his YouTube name and I wrote it because I didn't want to try to pronounce it but I, I appreciate you for sharing brother appreciate you for sharing and I appreciate everyone who shares and that I learn from all oh, there's so many I'm not gonna kid I'm not gonna name all I'm not gonna name all but I appreciate everyone who shares everyone who shares and it's crazy that he said that because I actually in a different part of the sanctuary I speak Jesus showed the sanctuary so many times in his ministry and in his life just as the brother broke down how Jesus came through this I love I love it how he broke down how Jesus came through the sanctuary in reverse the Shekinah he was God who came down from heaven to atone our sins he was the light of the world showed us how to communicate he was the word made flesh he because he was baptized we are, we all can become children sons and daughters of God he was the lamb that was slain so he could meet us at the gate and walk us back through the pattern I love that and it's crazy because this is how the Holy Spirit works I uh, I believe like a year ago I saw how remember Jesus said I am the temple of God Israel attacked Christ and they attacked every they attacked every vessel when they when they came at Christ they attacked every part of the sanctuary that was inside of him go to your Bibles to Mark go to Mark chapter 15 Mark chapter 15 this is where this is where they first were uh, is spoke about Mark chapter 15 and we we'll start at verse 29 Mark chapter 15 verse 29. my son gave me this for Christmas cuz I used to use pieces of their kite you know I, I used to get them the kites and they always bring them so they had a whole bunch I'm sorry y'all I had to do it real fast cuz it's been bugging me you know, I want to keep my mind on the study and not wondering oh I want to scratch my back but anyway Mark chapter 15 Mark chapter 15 and verse and 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 I and I will throw this in for some of you say, oh, your son got you that for Christmas. My, my my son is a child, and they know the truth about Christmas, and they live with their mother who doesn't. Let's just say she doesn't follow what the word says. So they do things, you know. They do celebrate Christmas. So when he got me this, out of the goodness of his heart, I didn't just throw it away like, oh boy, you ain't supposed to be sad. No, I accepted his gift out of love, and Daddy does has taught them the truth of Christmas. <laughs> And they still be like, okay, just where's our gift at? <laughs> but anyway, but the plant the seeds are planted for truth. Uh anyway, Mark 15, verse 29. Mark 15, verse 29 says, Now remember this. Well, I'll read it first. Mark 15, verse 29 says, And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah. Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking said among themselves with the scribes, He saved other himself. He could not save. He could not save. And I want to say in verse, verse 14, Mark 14, the chapter before, in verse 58, he says, we and then when they accused him, they said, "We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. Within three days, I will build another.' May this is just to prove when Jesus taught his body is the temple, his body is the temple, and they are doubting. I showed Mark Mark fifteen, verse twenty nine through thirty one was showing how they doubted that Christ's body was the temple. So that's one X. Remember, they're doubting that Christ is the sanctuary. He is the sanctuary. Remember the verse that we first read, Jeremiah 17, 12? Jesus is saying, I am sanctuary. So when it says, 17, 12 says, in the sanctuary was established from the beginning, God's high throne. It's all about Christ. Christ is the center of the whole universe. But anyway, so, okay, Mark 15 shows that they are doubting that Christ is the sanctuary made flesh. He was the sanctuary made flesh. Okay, that's one part that they attacked him. And I'm going to show in backwards, in reverse. We remember when the devil does stuff, he does stuff in reverse. Okay, how did they attack the law? Christ, go to Luke 6. Luke 6, 
I'm going to start at verse 1. Luke chapter 6, and I'm going to start at verse 1. Luke 6 verse 1 says, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked ears of corn, and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when himself was a hunger, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat but the priests alone? And he said unto them, That the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So right here, they were attacking Jesus' authority. They was attacking. They accused first they accused Christ of breaking the law. They was and they were always accusing Christ. I mean, that's just one example, but as you know, they were always accusing Christ of breaking the Sabbath, breaking the law. What does the Sabbath contain? In the Ten Commandments. So this this is where they you can X off this piece. They were always accusing Christ of breaking the law. So I was dealing with the Ark of the Covenant. What about the seven branch candlestick? Matthew 12. Now there are many examples for each of these pieces. And that's something fun you should do is go through the four gospels and look how they were attacking the sanctuary in Christ and the different vessels and different pieces. Matthew 12. I'm start at verse 24. Matthew 12, verse 24 says. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? Because they, they were calling Jesus Satan. They were attacking his his light. They was attacking him being a light. When you are a light, you are glorifying God in your character. But they was accusing Jesus of glorifying Satan. They was accusing Jesus of being Satan, saying his character, he was a demon. You know, if you say somebody a demon, you're not saying they have a good character. You're, you're calling them a demon. You know, they have the character of the devil. They're saying his character was of the devil, that he was a demon. A devil casting out devils, you know, so they were attacking his light. They were attacking his light. Well, what about his communion with God, his communication with God? You know, the altar of incense. Let's go to Matthew 9. Just a couple chapters before that. Matthew 9. Matthew 9 and verse 1. Matthew 9 and verse 1. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then said he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and goeth into the house. They was accusing God, Jesus, of being a blasphemer. Now, what's the meaning of bla What's the meaning of blas blasphemy? For those who don't know, it means to speak of the supreme being in terms of impious irreverence, to revile or speak reproachably of God or the Holy Spirit. It means to talk bad about God or to talk bad about the Holy Spirit, to speak evil of, to utter abuse or to speak reproachfully of. Basically, to speak bad about God. One who speaks of God in an impious and in reverent, irreverent terms. They were basically, when, so when they were accusing him of being a blasphemer, they were saying that his communication, we know the altar of incense is communication with God. They were saying that Jesus had evil communication of God. Jesus was just speaking bad of God and the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus had ill communications of God, evil communications with God. And what about the table of showbread? Go to John 6. John chapter 6. Start at verse 21. I'm going the wrong way. John chapter 6. And now, when you learn the sanctuary, verses like this, what I'm about to show you, starts to make sense. Now, the whole chapter is about what uh, about them trying to deny him being the bread of life. The whole chapter 6, but I'm going to just pinpoint some stuff. John chapter 6, verse 51. Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of of the world 52 the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat they're doubting that Jesus was the word made flesh they doubting Jesus said to them verily verily I said to you except ye eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood ye have no life in you whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life and I will raise him up in the last day and I will raise him up in the last day I'm gonna skip down to verse 59 he says, okay, I'll read 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? Does this offend you? And then I'm going I'm to skip down. I'm going to skip down to verse 66. It says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. See, what is it really taught is that there were like 77 disciples that walked with Christ beforehand. And once they left, once these left because of that saying, it was only 12 left. It was only 12 left. But you see what it says? They did not want to believe that Jesus was the word made flesh. And he was talking to them spiritually. But they were looking. If you're looking for an excuse to doubt Jesus and to walk away, you'll find it. And that's what was going on there. They were really looking for an excuse to doubt him and to walk away anyway. Because they were around him for the wrong reasons. And that's why they really didn't believe. That's why verse 64 says, For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. He knew he already knew from the beginning. But anyway, that was them attacking the table, the table of showbread. That was them attacking the table of showbread. Now, what about the baptism? Remember, baptism is when you're made new, you're cleansed, and you're a new creature, and you're born into the house of God. Well, let's go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. You say, how did they attack the baptism of Jesus? How did they attack Jesus being a new creature? Now, this one right here is deep, beloved. Believe it or not. And this is real deep right here. Matthew 27. And I'm going to start at verse 27. Matthew 27. I'm going to start at verse 27. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor... Matthew 27, verse 27 says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and they read in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, the king of Jews. That scarlet robe, scarlet, is the color of sin. Scarlet represents sin. And as you, you read in Isaiah, the verse slips my mind. Do I have it here? But as you read in Isaiah, scarlet is the color of sin and represents sin. So what the devil was signifying, because remember, Jesus was at a weak moment right here, and the devil was getting him to doubt that God, you know, that God would accept the sacrifice and the devil was determined to get sin on Christ any way he could he was desperate he was desperate so with with the signifying of them putting on this scarlet robe when Jesus puts Jesus's robe was what a robe of righteousness pure white 
the devil puts on him this scarlet robe, a robe of sin. He was trying to signify to Jesus. He was signifying, you are dirty. You are filthy. You are filthy. He was trying to get Jesus to think, God is never going to accept you. Look at you. He wanted Jesus to see this scarlet robe on him. The devil was like mocking him, saying, your robe of righteousness is gone, brother. That's like what he was saying to him. Your robe of righteousness was gone, brother. You're, you're, you're going to be kicked out, forever kicked out of heaven like me, like I was. Beloved, this is what was going on. So when, when these soldiers, who was actually doing the devil's work, when they placed this scarlet robe on Christ, that was actually uh, attacking the baptism. Because the labor, you're made new. You're cleansed. So the scarlet robe was representing sin. The sin being placed on Christ. They were saying, you're not new. You're not cleansed. You're not, you're not new. You're not some new creature. You're not clean. You don't have some righteous robe. You're dirty. You're filthy. They were attacking the baptism. And the sacrifice, how they were, how were they attacking the sacrifice of Christ? Stay in the same chapter, Matthew 27. And now let's read verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which is spoken of by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. They attacked the sacrifice by crucifying, basically. You know, some people think the sacrifice was just him dying as a lamb. Of course, that is, you know, blood had to be, blood had to be shed so we could be saved. I mean, that's just point blank. The wages of sin was death. Someone had to die to atone for sin. And that's how they attacked his sacrifice by when they crucified him and mocking him and mocking him mocking his sacrifice and like you know i don't have to even go into the last one in detail because you know it's sad to even think about but they mocked him you know on the cross the whole time he was on the cross making a mockery of his sacrifice you know saying that he really wasn't dying for our sins you know just mocking him so beloved that is how israel that is how they attacked the sanctuary that was in Jesus. And, and I want to pose this question to you. If you're not under attack by the devil. If, if he's not attacking you in your life. Could it be. That there's no sanctuary inside of you. Could it be you're just going to church. And that's all it is. Is that the sanctuary is this outward building. That. Like my good friend Amy uh, was excited about, and you'll see her comment on the end of part five, is that if the sanctuary isn't in your heart, that might be why the devil's not attacking you, because it's not here yet, yet, you know. And I know I've heard that a lot of times, that this, that we, our bodies are the temple, I'm pretty sure you've heard that too. Your body is the temple of the living God. I heard it my whole life. But I felt relieved when God showed me how his sanctuary becomes inside of me. How I become a living representative of his temple. You know, it's one thing to tell somebody something. But, you know, and then it's another thing to actually show them. Show Because I used to never really get it how my body was the temple how the temple was inside of me, how I could live the temple, you know, until God showed me. So it was a much I shared. And beloved, on the next one, the next video, the next video piece, just to give you a taste so you don't keep seeing part seven, part eight, and you're like, oh, you're probably going to say the same. The next one, I'm going to show how Israel as a whole walked through the sanctuary. Walked through the sanctuary. And I'll just, and not, you know, not only as a whole, and not only is that I'm going to show, well, I'm going to show first, on the first part, I'm going to show how Israel walked through the sanctuary, which I got from Ava Myers. Uh, which was, you know, I always love giving the credit what credit is due, which I got from Ava Myers. But what the Lord showed me personally 
was how Jesus, again, Jesus, the devil knows the word. And, beloved, okay, I, I, I'm going to give two quick clues, two quick clues. Jesus was already the lamb, so he didn't have to start right here. But when Jesus was baptized, and it's just a clue, go, go, go look this up. When Jesus was baptized... In, in 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 the book of er, in the beginning of Matthew when it talks about Jesus being baptized by John the Baptist, it says, "And the Spirit led him into the wilderness." Who? What? What part of the Trinity we say deals right here? The Spirit, right? Is it a coincidence that it says the Spirit led him into the wilderness? This is right after he was baptized. It says the Spirit led him into the wilderness. What's the first piece of furniture in the holy place? table of showbread what was the first temptation that the devil tempted Jesus with in the wilderness didn't he say if thou be the son of God turn that stone into bread beloved I'm going to show how the devil through the temptations in the wilderness attacked Jesus each vessel of Christ didn't you know remember Jesus was baptized the word says he was led by the spirit into the wilderness and the first temptation that Jesus said to him was turn these stones into bread I'm going to show in the next one how the devil attacked the oh, Jesus's sanctification and that is what he attacks every Christian he attacks our sanctification I'm going to show that in the next one. And I'm also going to show with Israel. And I'll just tell a little piece on what I'm actually talking about. I'm going to tell a little piece. It's how, you know, you look at Israel 12. Okay, when Israel was leaving Egypt, when they, when they finally, the night before Israel got the okay to leave, what happened? It was the Passover. The angel came by and killed all the firstborn, right? All the firstborn who didn't have what? Ooh. All the firstborn. <laughs> I get excited. All the firstborn who didn't have the blood of the lamb on top of the doorpost. Remember, this is the only door. This is the only way into the sanctuary. All those who didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, their firstborns were slain. Right after the blood of the lamb was posted on the doorpost and the firstborn was slain, the very next day they, they got the okay to leave. Pharaoh lets them leave. Then they get to the Red Sea. They get to the Red Sea. What's the next piece? Baptism. They get to the Red Sea and they're all forced. All of Israel is forced to walk through the water. Are you telling me that when Israel walked through the Red Sea, God was actually baptizing them? Trying to get them to break away from the old Egypt and into this new wilderness he was taking them? Ooh. Okay, okay, one more piece, one more piece. And after they walked through the Red Sea, almost that very next day, almost the very next day, God started raining down bread from heaven. Love it. The whole Bible is about the sanctuary. I'm going to leave it right there or I'll keep going. It's already an hour and ten minutes. I got to stop right there. But that's what we're going to dig into on the next one. That's what we're going to dig. Love it. The sanctuary is never ending. And once you understand the sanctuary, the whole Bible opens up to you and becomes so clear. Thank y'all for watching. This is not for me. This has changed my life. I appreciate and I love God for giving me the great honor to show me these things to share. I just hope, beloved, that you take them to heart and use them. We need them now more than ever in this day and time. I sin every day. And if it if it wasn't for the sanctuary and the things that I've learned, I'd still be going around in circles with my one little paddle 
trying to reach God, but I'm going around in circles, just holding on. I wouldn't know what sanctification is. I wouldn't know that I can be cleansed and made new every day. Go through the say you can use the sanctuary pattern every day. That's what it's there for. That's what the daily sacrifice was for. It was a daily, not just once a week, like the devil will have you to believe. You can just you just gotta go to church on on Sunday or Saturday, the Sabbath, you know. On your Sabbath or if you you go to church on the first day, you know, we tend to believe, oh, that's the only day you go to church. No. It, back in the Old Testament times, the sanctuary was open every day. It was called the daily sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. Every day, the sanctuary was open. You could go listen to a sermon, cleanse, and, you know, make atonement for you. Every day, every day, you can use this sanctuary. It's, it's there for us, and that's what it's there for. Y'all have a blessed day.